people, let's uh, let's start the show and let's see how the people will, you know, fix it or along the way make it uh, happen. Okay. Let me uh, tell you also how I want to conduct this because there are so many people. I would like to uh, make a presentation with a minimal interruption uh, and uh, you can use the chat to ask the question. Some people are already doing that, you know. Uh, and uh, one one fellow said his cam is broken, the other... So you can use the chat to ask the question so you are not interrupting my talk and I'm observing the uh, question and uh, then I can answer the question as I move along. And uh, most... Uh, what I would prefer at the end of the two hour talk, uh, then you can all come on uh, video and ask the question in uh, video. So we can have a full interaction. Hopefully by that time you'll figure out how to make sure that your video works and your audio works on your computer. If your computer works, I suggest one thing. If you all have, you all have a cell phone, connect, get connected on this meeting on a cell phone because every cell phone now has audio and video which works automatically, okay? So that's the point. All right, so now uh, let, me, uh, let me make, uh, me, me, uh, uh, first of all, I'll change the view to speaker view. So now you can see me, right? So now we are in a speaker view and when I'm in a speaker view, uh, you can see me talking and then whoever actually uh, gets to interact and talk, he will also show on a, a speaker. So I'm sharing the screen. So uh, now what you see on the screen, I just uh, froze a picture for a second. This is uh, picked up from an internet uh, uh, short video, like uh, 20 seconds or so on showing the very important experiment, which was done way back in 200 years ago, actually, uh, to be exact, to 201 years. And uh, he made experiment trying to prove that electricity and magnetism are not connected. You understand? So what he was uh, uh, trying to prove and had an actual demonstration, because at that time, 10 years prior to that, as uh, uh, Galvani discovered this, you know, live electricity by cutting the frogs, and then later the Volta figured out how to make out of that uh, voltaic pile or make a, for the first time, make, make a source of the electric power, a continuous power, rather than being just, uh, you know, the, the charge, which you had to rub to, to generate electricity. So, Erstad set out to do that the two things are not connected. And he made experiment in front of the audience and experiment was successful. What he did, he made a battery, as you can see here, and connected a volta voltic source battery with a constant current going through the wire and then put a magnetic needle at the top of it. And he expected to see that there is no effect on magnetic needle. Because magnetic needle, you know, the Earth has its own North and South Pole. And magnetic needle is such that it always points out to North Pole. Okay? So, uh, and when he made that experiment, it just so happened the direction of the current he put in was such that it was very little decline because the magnetic pole of the Earth was directing needle to go in one direction and uh, the current, which was close to that magnetic needle, had only auxiliary secondary order effect, but it was going in the same direction. And the one, one uh, person in the audience during the break, when everything seems like it was proven that they are not connected, he changed the direction of the current. You can just move the, uh, how you say, the uh, wire which connects the DC current and one which is right above that, make it go in the other direction. And of course, then then the, the thing swing widely in that direction. And that's what I'm showing here. See how the uh, needle swings widely uh, when uh, current is put through the wire. So that is uh, the uh, first uh, you know, establishment that the electrical current, uh, constant current creates uh, the uh, magnetic field. And that magnetic field acts on a needle 
to orient it in the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so uh, that's uh, given. Let's now move to something else. So I'm, I'm talking about Faraday and I'm saying that Faraday in 1821, uh, when he heard, in 1820, when he heard that at Faraday experiment, everybody tried to do the opposite. Well, you know, it makes sense, right? You have a constant current going and affecting magnetic needle. And then the thought was, can we do reverse and put a magnetic field? And there was at that time available permanent magnet. You can get a magnetic material, which is a permanent magnet. And you use a permanent magnet and say, okay, I'll put a now permanent magnet around the wire. And I try to get a generated DC current. Well, the only problem is it doesn't work. Even though the Faraday uh, spent from 1821 to uh, 1831 trying to prove just that. And what has happened, as you see here, he concocted this experiment, he's trying to repeat exactly that. He put a battery because that was the only source of the power at that time. So, so he put a battery uh, and put a switch in it and with the idea, he'll turn on the switch and we'll get uh, now uh, on this, what it looks like, it looks like and feels like a transformer, except it doesn't work like a transformer. <laughs> you know. And I explain in a second. And uh, the system he had is he had a, at that time, very sensitive galvanometer, which could me measure milliamps of the current. And then when you would turn a switch on a primary, this whole uh, gadget, and you can see it in a uh, display, the original transformer is a huge toroid. And he put a, a one winding on one side on, on that room, and he, in a, he put this uh, uh, battery source of the power and the switch in one room, and then uh, the toroid and galvanometer measuring in the other room. And he would initially spend uh, futile attempt trying to turn on the DC power and get a DC power on the output of his transformer, right? But it didn't happen. It, uh, why? Because he would come and turn a switch on in one room where this concoction was in the left-hand side on a primary is only one room, go to another room and wouldn't see anything until one day, I guess his assistant was again, uh, how you say, by a mistake came early so he told the system, turn the switch on, and he was working his room. And guess what? Just during that instance, when you turn the switch on, there was a declination of a, a recorded a current, transient current in a galvanometer, right? And then, uh, okay. Uh, so as you turn the switch off, again, there is declination in other direction. So that's where he discovered the law of uh, electromagnetic induction. And the people start seeing they can make an electromagnet if you put a, a magnetic core and uh, which dramatically increase uh, the flux in the core and force, then with a small current, you can pull out a big, uh, you know, attract the steel and move it from one place to another. But the point, they were all stuck at that time that you need a change of the current. And he introduced his Faraday law, but it was waited until later in 1860 uh, something, uh, 67 uh, is when uh, Faraday died. But before Faraday died, Maxwell uh, came and explained why it is impossible. And of course, he came along the way with the Maxwell equation, why it is impossible that a constant current uh, uh, operate in this uh, gadget. It is only uh, required. You can only operate in the, in this transient mode. And of course, what happened in the meantime? I think there are some people who realized. Well, if that is the case, they uh, try to make a how you say transformer uh, to operate not with a battery, but operate with the alternating generator, single phase generator, and then. It turns out if you put instead of a galvanometer, we put a light bulb, light bulb will shine. 
because it doesn't care. Light bulbs is a resistor. <laughs> so it doesn't care. Uh, it's not a motor that wouldn't work on a single phase uh, because it will move one or the other direction and it could be used. But that was uh, something that uh, people didn't believe in alternate current and alternate voltage. And what I want to impress on you is that uh, it took, and timing is the, um, Faraday died in uh, 1867. Uh, Maxwell died in 1879, three years before Tesla came with his rotating magnetic field and proved uh, them all wrong, which they all said alternating current is useless. We need to rectify it to get a DC generator. And that's what they were doing all, all along. And he came up with this rotating magnetic field, came up with the uh, really, uh, see, uh, came up with a way how you can utilize alternate current. Of course, he upped a, a stake by uh, changing it to uh, three phase, initially two phase and two phase. Then he can transfer with the transformer to very high voltage and uh, use it for a distribution with the no losses because that's a whole uh, point of a transformer. Now, uh, so the, the really, uh, when the thing started happening, so I, I very often make a point that since every, the whole world was uh, not believing into uh, uh, alternating current and uh, branded it as useless, then Tesla proved his in 1882 that it's just the opposite. One thing I wonder, and that's uh, unfortunately <laughs> with, the, with the whole world, you know, I wonder, I wonder if uh, Faraday and Tesla were um, alive when in Faraday and Maxwell were alive when Tesla did that, I'm sure they will give us sum up and say this is the greatest invention since sliced bread. Unfortunately, after they died, there was nobody of that statue to really back that up. And then there was a big war of current, whether we should use a DC for a transmission or a AC. And the funny thing is, uh, nowadays, we have all the tools in the power electronics to make it happen, to make a DC high voltage transmission, but uh, not the way they're doing it now, but uh, using it as a high voltage transmission because right now what they do is they are still stuck with the alternating current and they use the alternating current at high voltage to convert it to high voltage DC and use a high voltage DC cable because that's you can put under water and connect one island to another island in, in British islands. And then on the other end in the island we convert it back from DC to AC. But that's not a point. Now we can make a use of this beautiful device transformer, and especially uh, even for a single phase, we can make a DC to DC conversion high voltage, which is initially uh, using the source of power, not um, like Niagara power plant with the uh, converting the mechanical power with the generator, 64 generators in, a, in a, um, AC power, but use the sunlight, which comes naturally to DC and use a converter to transfer it uh, with the isolation to transfer it to very high voltage and then uh, step it down on the other end after transmission down to DC voltage. Anyway, everything except the motors now uses a DC power, electronics and the, the, all the other gadgets. So, so anyway, uh, the point is that uh, really a uh, burst of the alternate current and a new electricity is happening now. And I made a point like two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, when I made a previous uh, uh, introduction, you see what happened when the Texas ran out because of the cold, they're not prepared. And uh, for four days, they couldn't have electricity. People are dying. You know, everything was working on electricity. This whole world is hooked up in elect electrical uh, distribution system that uh, Tesla made happen. I first want to go to this overall big picture. And the big picture is that in um, uh, when Tesla came up in 1882, it was in 1895, there was a Chicago fair. And a fair in Chicago, uh, worldwide fair, was lighted with Edison lights 
but use the power, alternating power, and not the Edison DC power. And that was uh, uh, because uh, Westinghouse won a contract to light up a show and not Edison company. And that was uh, when, uh, for the first time, the transformers were used with the S Tesla generators with generating three phase power. I showed here just single phase and then uh, transmit it throughout the show and then uh, use it effectively to light up the whole show. Okay, so that is uh, 1895. It's already first use of uh, uh, electricity it was happening a couple of years before that, 1893. I think it's first one that uh, at Niagara Falls established the uh, first power transmission and uh, uh, transmitted the power, uh, huge power uh, to megawatts to nearby um, Buffalo where they had a big uh, uh, bauxite, uh, which was then needed to convert into aluminum by using electrolysis and needed the tens of thousands of current. So that was a beautiful demonstration what was uh, possible. Uh, Okay, now uh, just to do a plug for my course. <laughs> that you're lucky because now we are uh, getting in a new world. I used to give my course, which is called the Power Electronics 50 Years in Four Days. And I, just as I was going to do it in five days, 10 hours per day, then it turned out pandemic and we couldn't do in house, uh, in person courses. Uh, but that's why I'm now doing, uh, I already done in the end of September, uh, transition in which uh, some people sign up for my in-person course, and then we had to move them to uh, online. And now my online course, uh, which was originally just uh, two weeks, uh, and each week is uh, like four hours per day. Now I decided to make it available to the whole world. So this is now uh, basically six weeks. Uh, two hours per day each week, and that makes it possible that everybody in the world can join, literally, uh, because uh, eight o'clock uh, in the morning is seven o'clock in the evening in India. It is a midnight, uh, it's noon time in the whole of South America. In Europe, it's five o'clock in the afternoon, so, so everybody can join. And hopefully we can fix this <laughs> Zoom uh, in time to uh, make, a, like I did last time, uh, two weeks of uh, uh, courses. The other uh, plug uh, that I make for a course, um, and some people who took my course in September, they um, said that uh, the course in itself is worse even if I don't, because I reduced dramatically the price so everybody in the world can afford it. But all, uh, the one thing which comes along with the course is uh, not only my introduction, but I get a special uh, online high call. Uh, special uh, cloud storage on a box.com, which is specially reserved just for attendees of the course. And when you sign up for a course, you get all my lectures, notes in the color, all my patents, all other um, uh, video clips and so on to study before coming to the course. So uh, you, I'm uh, then coming to the course a couple of months later to present it and then make a, a sense out of such a, a huge amount of information connected. That's what I'm trying to do here. Okay. Uh, the other thing what you see here and what I, <laughs> what I want to uh, emphasize is hopefully uh, today I will have a chance to say a little bit about it uh, using my pen and draw. But here is a cartoon I made uh, several years ago uh, and used it in my in-person course. Uh, and the cartoon is, uh, as you see here, I don't know, yeah. You see the, the cartoon is basically saying that the power electronics made a huge mistake, double mistake. Okay, and I, I will tell you, uh, hopefully after this, uh, I will be able to go through the detail. Uh, two big mistakes. One thing is uh, they forgot that uh, the Faraday's law, and in fact, it was uh, in 1830, uh, uh, it was uh, claimed that uh, Joseph Henry, who was professor at Princeton, came independently to the 
uh, law of electromagnetic induction, but he never published it. And so it was too late when a few years later, he found out that uh, Faraday already published it widely. In any case, the point is, it's kind of interesting because that was a, a, a birth of the alternating system really, because inductance is an alternating component. It's an AC component. Uh, the, and what happened? The uh, unit for uh, the capacitance was named Faraday because signifying, well, he was uh, uh, essentially starting this uh, new world when we didn't have just any more resistors that we are stuck with the resistors of the Ohm's law, we now had the, the capacitance. But of course he should have been given a, a unit for inductance because that's his law, but uh, Henry uh, was given unit of inductance and Faraday's unit of capacitance. But anyway, they are two people who essentially were uh, uh, forefathers of the alternating current systems. And, and don't forget, alternating current systems were depending on using transformer as an AC component. And uh, uh, using inductance as an alternating current inductance, not, and just like uh, Faraday couldn't prove that his uh, transformer structure could work with the DC source and the input, it has to work with on AC. Likewise, the uh, inductances uh, really were alternate components. And the, the big mistake was made that in uh, 19, well, he even make, a, I would say even in 1900, at the beginning when they needed some alternator and so on, they invented, quote, invented the uh, flyback converter which was able to generate uh, high voltage spikes uh, to start the engine, whatever, instead of being a, a different thing. So the, the whole field uh, later came down to have these uh, three basic converters, which are called buck, boost, and the flyback, which use uh, inductance, but not as an AC inductor. They conduct a DC current through it. And what is bad with that? This is a fake inductor. And I'm trying now, now for last 30, 40 years to tell the whole field, you are just working on the wrong premise. This is, if you put a, a there are two things that I, I would like to uh, explain uh, maybe here when I go and about transformer. You know, one, uh, and I, I'll uh, explain it in the words and then hopefully uh, drawing a sound. One beautiful part of the, transformer operating at 60 Hertz. You have to understand the transformer operated at 60 Hertz. It has a both a flux balance, which is needed to operate uh, on a periodic waveform. Uh, that means alternating generator, single phase or three phase, they generated AC power, which is a zero average. In fact, the transformer are not allowed to have any DC current in it. Why? Because even a milliamp or a few amps of DC current imbalance will saturate the core of a transformer, which has normally no gap and make, instead of transformer having a 100,000 relative permeability, which is 100,000 bigger slope than in the air, bigger inductance in the air, it'll become a short. And you don't want to have a transformer with a short. So the point is the transformer is device because automatically alternating generators generate DC, uh, generate alternate uh, balance power, positive and negative uh, parts of a sine wave result in a zero average. There is no DC voltage in it, no DC current, okay? So that's automatic. Uh, and uh, the in fact, when I started my company in 19, uh, you know, 2001 to uh, 19, uh, uh, what was it? 1970, 1960s, yeah, 1970 plus 1967. Uh, then uh, I made a first in a company at that time through Sandia Laboratory, first uh, um, converter, which convert uh, uh, DC power 
into alternating current and pump the power in the utility line. And we get to make sure that when we pump the power in phase with the utility line, that we don't create any DC average because that will saturate the 60 hertz transformer disaster, all right? So the point I'm saying is uh, the 60 hertz transformer beauty of it is an alternating current is automatically ahead of all second balance, flux balance. Okay, we'll, we'll go through more detail, just putting a big picture now. It also has, at the same time, it has a charge balance. What that means, if you put a DC voltage source, a AC voltage source on the primary, you are going to, uh, you're going to have a huge inductance when you have this core. And the huge inductance will say that the current drawn from a source will be very little. Yes, it'll be shifted 90 degrees from a voltage, but the magnitude will be very small. And that current, when a secondary is open and a primary is excited with the uh, source on the input, draws very little current. But that is all what you need to create small uh, current in the primary, create so-called uh, ma magnetizing current, which generates a flux in the core. And the flux in the core by Faraday's law, ND phi per dt, creates op opposing voltage, opposing the uh, generator voltage on the primary to make a balance on the primary. But if you put a sec another winding on the secondary, that will generate the same voltage. But the point is that voltage on the secondary, as you see, I have a dot connection. If you put a resistive load, the current will be driven by that voltage, identical voltage on the secondary will be driven uh, to go out of the dot into the load. But that means the current on the primary, a reflected current on the primary is also uh, uh, coming uh, into the dot. So that means the primary current minus secondary reflected current they cancel and create this small magnetizing current. The point is magnetizing current is something which is necessary to make it work, but, uh, and it doesn't change. It is 1% of the power. And when you start loading the secondary with more power, all the power on the secondary comes at the expense and the increase of the input current and uh, this circulating magnetizing current stays the same, very little. In fact, there was a push to make a 60 Hertz transformer, which will have a very high um, uh, magnetizing inductance uh, with 100,000 silicon steel, 100,000 permeability. So therefore this uh, nuisance current, which needs to have everything going is small, independent of the load. And now what we have, now the people, uh, making the no, uh, so they have the point i'm making this beautiful transformer uh, has already everything in it which we didn't make it right because when we made switch power conversion we introduced quantity of uh, components like uh, inductors which is and call it inductor and worse yet use a symbol same symbol of inductor which i blame there you know i triple e of uh, for each uh, new device they invented a special symbol for a bipolar transistor, MOSFET, a gallium nitride, you name it, silicon carbide. And then for an inductor, they kept the same symbol as though it was AC inductor. That was a lie. That was a fake inductor. That inductor couldn't take uh, the milliamps of the current and it would saturate. And instead of being huge inductance and huge impedance, it'll be short. Okay. And what we, what the people made, the people made concoction that they called it, uh, Put an air gap in a magnetic flux, kill the uh, killed inductance by a factor of 100 or 200, and then said, "Oh, now we can conduct the current, uh, DC current through it." But why it is fake? Because then they skewed the whole field. That when we switch, we get 20 kilohertz and could only put a very small current, 10, 20 amps, before saturating. And they said, "No problem. If you want to increase it, uh, we will uh, increase the." Uh, frequency. And by increasing frequency, you need less inductance. So they are basically increasing frequency only for the sake of a, that that concoction was killing inductance. And therefore they had to make it up with a 10 times, 100 times higher frequencies, but they didn't, didn't result in anything uh, useful because of those frequencies, uh, efficiency 
uh, was down to pot and didn't get uh, any uh, advantages in reducing size of magnetic. So original, original thought that when we go, remember the 60 Hertz equipment, when it's used motors and generators, when they're used in the ships, they don't use 60 Hertz, you use the 400 Hertz. Why? Because they have proportionally, you know, from 50 Hertz to 400 Hertz, eight times smaller size of a generators, eight times smaller size of a motors. So what we all hope when we go now to 20 kilohertz, we'll have another factor of 10 or 100. So now the motors and generators will operate those frequencies will be really small. Didn't happen because the whole field then went in the wrong direction. Okay. Anyway, just wanted to tell you that what is really needed, and that's what I'm putting an emphasis in this course, is saying that we started in the wrong foot. We started in the wrong foot by having this uh, back boost and the flyback, which all have a, an inductor, which is really not inductor. And also we started on the wrong foot, which I'll explain in a, in a minute. Uh, what existed uh, before I came into this field in 1974, when I started my PhD uh, at Caltech and finished in 1976, there were converters which derived from a back a uh, way to provide isolation transformer. But the, again, they provided isolation transformer and not taking into account that you have to make now this transformer uh, have a performance of the 60 Hertz transformer. In a 60 Hertz transformer, you had a flux balance and you had a charge balance, as I just explained. The secondary current demagnetizes, uh, uh, reduces uh, uh, primary currents and results in a, a small difference, which is magnetizing current. You need to have both of these features in order to make a successful transformer for high frequencies. 